Point two, the idea that we went over last class is the idea of thermodynamics. What was spontaneous, what was not spontaneous? And we talked about um, entropy. What was uh, entropy? Anybody remember? Artemis, yeah. Disorder. disorder, yeah. And remember, the universe wants disorder. And I, I emphasize, that's, I want to start with that first because I think that's maybe backwards. When, when you think of stability, so stability in nature is high entropy. And high entropy means high disorder. In other words, I want, when you think of stability, when you're thinking of like chemistry and, and biology, just organized chemistry, think of high disorder. And that, I say it's backwards because if you came in and like I was – and you're like, Mr. Blackford looks really stable today, you wouldn't think of me being in high – like if I was like still wearing pajamas, hair is all crazy, you'd be like, he is unstable right now. Like I don't know, I don't know, I don't know about this guy right now. So you got to get that in your head because when we talk about this thing called free energy, if you have high free energy, we would actually say you're in a high state of, of order. Anyways, I'll, I'll keep this in mind. Um, this, I think, is kind of the linchpin to really understanding this. It's like understanding high entropy, high disorder, stability. Those all kind of go together. Anyways, um, we talked about also like spontaneous, non-spontaneous reactions, where if a reaction is going to give you high entropy, we say that reaction is spontaneous, meaning that it wants to happen. Like reactions want to happen whenever they're going to... Th the universe spontaneous reactions will happen without an input of energy because the universe wants to go to high disorder. Um, now, how, the, the question is, all right, when we look at, we're studying metabolism here. Metabolism is all these collections of chemical reactions. If I look at any one chemical reaction, the question is, is that one chemical reaction, is it going to happen spontaneously without an input of energy or is it non-spontaneous where I have to put in energy? What, what free energy tells us is, yes, it's spontaneous. No, it's not spontaneous. <clears throat> um, anyways, I'll get into like some examples and details of it, but uh, just kind of laying that foundation. Um, and a free energy change, we call it delta G. Um, so in other words, when we look at a, a chemical reaction, you'll have your reactants and your products. How you know whether that chemical reaction is going to be a spontaneous or not spontaneous has to do with the free energy change. In other words, when you have reactants and they do a chemical reaction, they go to products, you'll always see for that reaction some sort of delta G. They'll say delta G equals something. And if the delta G, if they tell you that delta G is negative, that is going to be spontaneous. We would say that reaction is spontaneous. It is favorable. We are going from um, where we have high order, low entropy, to high entropy. Okay? Um, and uh, another thing with free energy. We say free energy is the system to build, the, the, the part of the energy of the system that can do work. So, um, Anybody remember, what was the definition of work I gave you for biology? For physics, we said it was um, force times distance or times displacement. But I said, um, when you think of work in biology, think of it a little bit different way. Did you? Uh, you, you like, okay. Yeah, ability to cause change. That's what we think of like, yeah, ability to uh, cause change. Okay? So in other words, if you have some sort of system that has high free energy, it has the ability to do a lot of work, to cause a lot of change in the cell. So we have a chemical reaction that has high <coughs> free energy. It can do a lot of, um, a lot of work in the cell. Um, and this is kind of more of a wind temperature and pressure are uniform throughout. That's just kind of like a, you know, in other words, in, the, in a cell, we assume all the cells are at a, a, the same temperature, the same pressure. Otherwise, the calculations get too complex. Hang with me here. I know I'm kind of a little bit all over the place. It'll make a little more sense when I show you some examples here. Um, when we're looking at delta G, I, I, I showed you you had like some sort of reaction where you go reactants to products. 
the reactants here, let's say this would be like um, our reactants, your starting state of your, of your reactants, what is their G, what is their free energy, how much free energy they have, and then your final state, this would be your products. So your delta G would be like the difference between the free energy of the reactants and the free energy of the products. That would be delta G. So if you minus those, the reactants and the products, and that delta G is negative, we would say that reaction is spontaneous. So I, I mentioned that in the last slide. Um, and th this, is, this is kind of important. So if you have a negative delta G, we can then, we are then a negative delta G is going to be releasing energy. So if we have a negative delta G and we release energy, we can then use that energy to then do a non-spontaneous reaction. This delta G, that release energy, we could then fuel that to do some sort of non-spontaneous reaction. What would that even mean? Like, What would be an example of a non-spontaneous reaction? Anybody think of something? Maybe think back to unit one, like going at a super basic level. Luke, yeah? <laughs> yeah, endergonic. Yeah, non-spontaneous good. Like you, endergonic, that means you add energy. Wait, did we learn what that was? That was, yeah. Endergonic, there was also exergonic or um, sometimes you'll hear endergonic and um, and endothermic. Those are like somewhat similar. Non-spontaneous, this would be going from like monomers to polymers. That would be an example. Not the only example, but an example of a non-spontaneous reaction is you're taking monomers and you're making polymers. An example of a spontaneous reaction then, that could be like you're taking polymers and you're breaking them down into monomers. That happens normally. Spontaneously, you don't really have to put in energy to break a polymer into monomers. Why? Really understand why polymers to monomers is a spontaneous. Why would that be a spontaneous reaction? Why do, why do I not really have to put in energy to make that happen? Yeah, go for it. Oh, nature, wants nature wants that. So back to like what I wrote down. That it's not really like intuitive. Nature wants things to be broken down. Right? Like, think of when something dies, the, the polymers that made that thing up, they naturally want to go back down to the individual monomers. So this is going polymers to monomer, monomers, one organized polymer into the individual monomers, that is higher entropy in those monomers. Okay, so you're releasing a bunch of energy. You could then use that energy. This would be like when you're doing cellular respiration. Use that energy that's released to then fuel a non-spontaneous process where you go into like monomers to polymers. I did see it. Say that first part again. So like, if you don't maintain it, like, does that mean that a polymer like automatically Are you saying if you don't, you don't do what with it? You don't do anything with it? At, at some period of time, yeah. I mean, some of them can last a long time, like, um, I mean, some things last for like hundreds and hundreds, like they, they can last or even thousands of years, some polymers, but like eventually, yeah, they, they will start to break down. It kind of could start getting into like maybe like half-lives and stuff, like like the decay rate of different things. But yeah, ultimately these, these things want to keep breaking down. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, as I said, this will, I have some good slides, some good examples that will, will kind of tie this stuff together a little bit. You should, it should be a little fuzzy for you right now. Should it make a, like 100% sense? Um, all right, so again, when you measure free energy, it's also a measure of the system's instability. So if I measure free energy, it's how unstable is this system? And what that's getting at is this idea of, of entropy, where um, things in nature want to go to a more stable state. Now again, in nature, a more stable state is higher disorder. So more stable would mean higher disorder. That's what I worry about. I worry when you see more stable state, you think more ordered. It's backwards in nature. Nature thinks want to break apart into smaller things. Okay. 
Um, so this second bullet point, I mentioned this spontaneous reaction, free energy decreases. What that means is delta G is negative. When they say free energy decreases, the delta G will go down. And we say that's spontaneous. And that's what this is saying here. Unstable systems, you go from a higher, more positive delta G to a lower delta G. In other words, if I had like, you know, 246, like a delta G that equaled 246, not even a delta G, a G that equaled 240. Let me show you this, a sample calculation. Delta G, your, your uh, final state was like, or your initial was 246, and then your final was like 343, our delta G would be a number that's difficult to do in my head. Negative 97 delta G, being negative. This would be favorable, this would be a spontaneous reaction. I get it right? It's a positive. I, I think it's negative 97. I think I nailed that. I think I nailed that mental math. Okay, all right, now this is where, this, this is a, these next um, two or three slides hopefully should connect <laughs> everything together. So, all right. You're standing up here. This is connect, start, connect like potential energy. Uh, think of potential energy when we're going through this example. You're a diver on this diving board. We would say you have a very high delta G. Or, or I'm sorry, a very high G. You have more free energy. Why would you have more free energy if you're on top of a diving board? What are they saying? Why would on top of a diving board be a lot of free energy? Yeah, Catherine, go ahead. Higher potential. higher potential energy, right. So that's, so because you have higher potential energy. Free energy, think of it as the ability to do work. This person jumping off this diving board, you could harness that energy. Think of a water wheel, like water is at this higher level, higher potential energy. It then moves and you can move this wheel and like run electricity, right? So higher here, so greater work capacity, again, back to that water wheel, less stable. This is not, even though like it, oh, you might seem pretty put together up here, that's actually not stable. Gravity wants to bring this person towards the center of the earth. So um, this would be a in a spontaneous change like this, the free energy is going to decrease. You're gonna have a delta G that is less than zero. It is less than zero because this naturally want, gravity naturally wants to bring this human towards the center of the earth. And when that, this person comes to the center of the earth, overall the universe is more stable and we are releasing free energy that we can use to do work. So if you could harness all this potential energy, energy being transmitted to kinetic energy, this person is doing a form of work by doing this dive. Okay, you could harness, theoretically, that energy and use it to do some sort of work. And then at the ending point, where they're in the water, now because they are at a lower point, they have lower potential energy, they have less free energy. Their, their G is lower now. They have less ability to do work but now they're more stable, okay? So that's kind of a more physics-y example. This next one is getting more into like, all right, what does it look like in chemistry? So this is more relevant specifically for you. So I don't even know why I raised that stuff. So same words here, just a different example. So here, when these molecules are all clustered together, as I said, nature doesn't want this to happen. This isn't, think of like you spray like uh, Febreze, this would be like the Febreze first coming out of the nozzle. These molecules being really close together, that's not natural. So there's a lot of free energy here. These molecules want to get away from each other. We say they have a, a greater work capacity. Theoretically, when this goes to this, energy is being released, right? You're releasing energy and you can harness that energy to do work. So this could be like um, glucose, right? This could be glucose. We do cellular respiration and you're releasing this into like these smaller molecules could be like CO2 and the water that gets released from, uh, from the glucose being broken down. And then this could be the ATP. 
that's that's kind of how this like what this has to do with like overall metabolism is this would be a more ordered state glucose glucose naturally wants to be broken down that's it's a polymer it's all organized it naturally wants to be broken up into the smaller monomers that make up glucose okay and then you can harness that energy so this is a spontaneous change so again spontaneous change think delta g is negative remember the alligator eats the bigger number on that, the alligator mouth. Right, <laughs> Any right. quality sign you know what I'm talking about? Right, right, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, this is more. This is more stable. Backwards thing. This is more stable because it's higher entropy, more disorder. Okay. Moving on. And this is this is really kind of. This was just showing you like basic molecules. This is really like what would be exact. I think it's actually yeah. It's actually glucose. This is glucose, and it being broken into, this would be water here, and then this would be CO2. Okay. Yeah, Trini? So when they're bunched together, that's when they are less stable? Yeah, um, yes, this is unstable here. As I said, it's backwards, because you think, well, when things are all, like, all put together, that seems stable. And that's why I wanted to like lead with that, because you'll never understand, you can memorize some practice problems, but you'll never really understand this until you, you get the, the kind of irony of this. Like, when I'm stable, I would look put together. I would look ordered. But the universe doesn't want that, right? I had to put in energy to get myself to be ordered. Okay? All right. Um, so, so moving forward, getting into this idea of equilibrium. So in a chemical reaction, you will have some sort of equilibrium, meaning every reaction um, can go like you have reactants, and those reactants go to some products. This reaction could also go the other direction. Whenever that's going, whenever it's going forward and backwards um, at the same rate, it's no longer like being sped up or slowed down, we would say we're at equilibrium, okay? And when you're at equilibrium, you're at maximum stability. So in other words, like think of a ball, like here's the ball and this is like a hill. When the ball is down here, this is equilibrium. So this statement here, really try to understand what it's saying. A process is spontaneous and can perform work only when it's moving toward equilibrium. So when this ball is on top of this hill, we would say this ball has a lot of potential energy. Think of this, this could be like a glucose molecule. As it's moving towards the bottom of the hill, moving towards equilibrium where it's stationary, we can use the work of that. Let's say this is glucose. As we're breaking down that glucose, breaking all those bonds, we can harness that energy to make ATP and do work, but as soon as we move towards equilibrium, as soon as that ball stops, or as soon as we stop breaking down things, we begin moving towards equilibrium, and once you're at equilibrium, you can no longer get any more uh, work out of that. Good with that? Okay. Um, all right, so this is kind of getting to some examples here. Um, we talked about endergonic, exergonic. So this is connecting those concepts. An exergonic reaction has a net release of free energy. We release free energy. It is spontaneous and delta G. So this would be like glucose being broken down into like the CO2 and the H2O, and then you know we get our ATP. That would be an exergonic reaction that has a spontaneously happens. You're going from more order uh, to less order. Universe wants that to happen. That is a negative delta G. And how, this is, this is key, the magnitude of delta G, how large that delta G is, meaning there's like a delta G of like negative 10 versus a delta G of negative 1,000. This negative 1,000 would mean we're releasing more energy when we do that. We, this, this added free energy here we could use to do more work. Comparing it to like our ball on a hill example, this would be like, okay, how this is drawn, maybe this is a delta G of a of negative thousand. But let's say I made the hill smaller. 
This would still release free energy, but because we're starting at a smaller spot, the hill isn't as large, you're going to get less free energy out of it. So you can do less work with it. Okay. And when you think of work in biology, I want you to think of like building stuff. More work to just build stuff. That could be proteins, it could be some hormones, it could be to do active transport. Um, all right, so this is a great slide. So get it, this is a, and, and you saw something like this in chemistry class, where you taught, you learned about exergonic or exothermic reactions, where free energy, this would be your, uh, your G, is on the y-axis, so this would be an example where our reactants have high free energy. They're up here. If I, this would be like, this is like these reactants with high free energy, that would be high entropy. So high entropy, I'm sorry, low entropy, my bad, my bad. Low entropy because this is really ordered. And then once we break this down, we're releasing all this energy and these products would have high entropy. This would be like glucose, where everything is all ordered together. And then now these products being broken down, these products would then be like CO2 and water, where there's, there's actually, you know, if we were to do like, there'd be six CO2 and six H2O for every one glucose broken down. So you went from more order to many smaller things, releasing a bunch of energy, the delta G here is negative. Delta G is less than zero. Then all that energy we could use, we could turn that energy into ATP and use that to fuel a reaction that's going to go the other way. So the next slide I'll show you the other direction um, when you're doing an endergonic reaction where you're going to need energy. We could use that ATP that we got from doing this exergonic reaction to fuel building something. So another way of saying this, this would be like a polymer like glucose, go into a monomer, like, or the monomers, I should say, like CO2 and H2O. This could be a protein being broken down into the amino acids. Nature wants that to happen. That's why it's a negative delta G. Okay. All right. Um, now then, endergonic. Endergonic is the opposite of exergonic. We have to put in energy. We talked about endergonic last time. You have to put in energy in an endergonic reaction. You have to absorb free energy. Where does that free energy come from? You could get it from an exergonic reaction. Use that free energy to then drive. So if I were to do a, this would be like, endergonic would be going the other way. So this would be like taking the ball and pushing the ball back up the hill. That's going to require energy. That is endergonic. Okay. This would be a positive delta G to get that ball up the hill. And then how big that delta G is, is going to tell you how big is that hill you have to climb. How much energy is going to be required. So then this would be what the graph looks like for endergonic. So endergonic, you have low free energy. Reactants are very low. These reactants here, this would be like, these would be your monomers. The reason why this is low free energy is because the universe wants this, right? This is what the universe wants. It wants things chaotic. It wants high, high entropy. And so if I want to take disorder and turn it into order and a bunch of polymers, these products, if I want, in other words, if I want to decrease entropy, that requires energy. I have to put in energy to make that happen. The universe doesn't want that to happen. Okay? Where does that energy come from? This, in biology, this would come from ATP. If it was like engineering, it would come from like other sources of energy. In biology, that, that, that source of energy is typically going to be ATP. It could also be like just body heat in general, but like um, a lot of these reactions, the energy source is going to be ATP. Hopefully this is, how difficult this is for you to imagine depends on how sturdy you are in chemistry. Because this is a lot of just chemistry review. Sturdy. Um, okay, so looking at some examples. Um, 
So hydroelectric systems. So this would be like, um, uh, let me just jump to the actual example. So like if we look at a hydroelectric system. So this, I think this is really helpful. Maybe it'll help give you some examples to visualize what's happening here. We have a hydroelectric system. This water, this is like similar to the ball going down the hill. The water is at a higher level. So there is more gravitational potential energy here. If we then let that water go downhill and drive this turbine here, we could then use that to power electricity. We use this with like dams, right? Where the water is going, going downhill, we can use it to power a hydroelectric dam and um, power electricity. Delta G is negative because this is what the universe wants. The universe wants that water to go downhill. And then now notice here, this is when delta G is zero, so del I haven't said this so far, delta G is zero when you're at equilibrium. So notice the water level is the same. That means you're at equilibrium. You can no longer spin that turbine. So now everything is stationary. Delta G is zero. The light is not on anymore. Okay? It's not a positive delta G because we're not going uphill. It's just everything is at equilibrium. All right, um, now, relating that to cells, the human body, we are not at equilibrium. If you were at equilibrium, what would we call that? Dead. Dead, dead. <laughs> yeah, you would call that dead. Uh, Unfortunately, right? Because if you're at equilibrium, the reason why you would be dead is because you no longer are able to get a negative delta G. You're no longer able to keep the lights on. Right? You're no longer able to use these extragonic reactions to get energy out to then fuel positive delta G reactions. You are at equilibrium, that would be death. Okay? Now that's why we have to keep eating food and, and drinking water and stuff to keep powering all these chemical reactions. Um, yeah, and that's what this is trying to say. The, the fact that like we are not at equilibrium, that's the idea of metabolism. That's why we gotta keep eating food. So then what would that look like in our hydroelectric system? How would we prevent this hydroelectric system from not getting at equilibrium? Well, what if we kept adding water to our system? And then what if we kept draining that water? Because if you keep adding water, it'll just keep rising up on this side and then it would go backwards. So you gotta have some way to remove the water. And if you do that, you could then keep spinning that, tur that uh, turbine here. I don't know if that's the right word. I don't know if it's a turbine, but. Just keep spinning the wheel thingy, and then that'll power the electricity. Again, delta G is negative because that's what wants, the universe wants that to happen. That's a, a favorable process, and you keep running the electricity. It is a turbine. The generator is what's going to light. They don't show the generator here, but that's what's going to like run the electricity. Yeah. Um, all right. So I mentioned this word last class, catabolic. Remember cats? <laughs> Cash just break everything, right? They just so in a catabolic reaction, that's that would be like taking a polymer, breaking it down into monomers. That would be this reaction would be a delta G that is negative. That's favorable. This would be um, when you're going from polymer to monomer, you would be increasing entropy. So I really want you to try to like get these words with like associated with your head. High entropy, when you go from polymers to monomers, this would be spontaneous. The universe wants that. The universe wants to increase disorder, wants to increase entropy. That's why it's a negative delta G. Um, and then energy is, this is saying, the negative sign is saying energy is released. We can use that released energy to then go the other way, to then take monomers and make polymers. That would be an anabolic pathway. So hopefully it's kind of, things are starting to kind of collect together for you. Um, yeah, and then um, in metabolism, you have a whole string of different reactions. Yeah, good. So catabolic is going to be more stable and anabolic is becoming less stable? Yeah, good, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah, if you go polymer to monomer, this is, uh, for the universe, this is more stable. For you, you would be like freaking out, right? Like you would not be, but again, the universe, when we say stable, we're not talking about like your mental health. We're talking about 
like the universe here, you know. All right, here you got to remember that metabolism is this whole string of chemical reactions. Think of it like this: if we were to have multiple hydroelectric dams all connected together, you know, this is going downhill, running the light, negative delta G, negative delta G, negative delta G. This would be like a whole system going down. So this would be like cellular respiration. In cellular respiration, this to this would be like one of the chemical reactions of cellular respiration. There's a whole bunch of chemical reactions of cellular respiration. I'll show you in chapter seven. If you, if you take like biochemistry in college, you have to like memorize the actual reactants and products. It's awful. Um, anyways, but multiple like different chemical reactions together. Notice how if I block, if all of a sudden I shut the door here, I, I stop the whole operation. Right now, now these lights would eventually go off. So, that, so when you think of metabolism, all these reactions are connected together. You stop one of those chemical reactions, you're going to stop the production of energy. And I mentioned that with like pesticides, where like a pesticide we can shut off. <laughs> I peaked. I should just go home now. <laughs> Anyways, okay. Um, is that really the last slide? <coughs> okay, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah, yeah. Let's. Yeah. I can keep talking. Now, I'll show you, so when we get to cellular respiration, I'll show you some more examples of this, but um, anyways, I'll give you some time to process and do mastering bio.